Hi, everyone. Uh, this is going to be episode number eight uh, in our series on famous quotes on Paul. This will be about Thomas Paine. Uh, this is, uh, I started this series because I went into a trial and I wanted to have things easily to uh, relay without having to do a lot of research. Uh, but I think this is going to be kind of interesting. We will probably continue this uh, after the trial is over, probably tomorrow. This is a uh, profile of uh, quotes from Thomas Paine's work, The Age of Reason, Being an Investigation of True and Fabulous Theology. Uh, it's London. It was written in 1794. This is actually the original book. You can get it out for free at uh, books.google.com. And um, so we will now listen to a couple of his quotes. And I'm going to also include some other quotes just about uh, Christianity in general. Uh, because they're really reminders of us that outside of our little cocoon that we're in, there's another perspective we need to not not agree with, but necessarily we should hear what he's saying. Are we are we uh, uh, being duped, in other words, in some respect? And that's part of his argument. But uh, he does not accept the revelation of holy. The, 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 the law and prophets. He doesn't accept that. Well, Paul destroyed that, right? Paul said it's you know, evil and despicable and all these kind of comments. And it was gone. It was disappeared. It was a burden. It was a, it put us in bondage. So these are the things that Morgan in the last episode we showed you was explaining. Uh, Payne takes it a little bit further and uh, we'll, we'll see what that is. And he, he, uh, he, well, anyway, let's go into it. We'll see. All right. So here we are. Uh, we're going to look at these two quotes from 1794 in the book, Age of Reason. That manufacturer of quibbles, St. Paul, wrote a collection of letters under the name of epistles. Out of the matters contained in those books, the church has set up a system of religion very contradictory to the character of the person whose name it bears. It has set up a religion of pomp and of revenue in pretended imitation of a person whose life was humility and poverty. Very good point. You you become a pastor, you have a right to make a living by preaching uh, and teaching uh, words that you claim are from Jesus, who said what? <laughs> freely you received, freely you must give. And basically, the only way you could support yourself as a missionary, Jesus says right there in, in, in Matthew 10, is if you uh, you should basically give instructions to follow the, the law on a worker who's worthy of his wage. And basically, if you knew the law, you would know what he's talking about. He's saying there's a passage that says, if you become a guest in someone's home, you then do work in that home. Uh, you could then be, be asked the person who gave you at first room and board for free. You can now say, hey, you know what? I've been doing all the chores around the house. I've been cleaning up pig pens. I've been, you know, uh, getting all the animals fed every morning, waking them up, feeding them and doing all this work for you. I think it's a reasonable thing. You should pay me a wage for it. And the Bible mandates that. You see, that says, Jesus says, that's how you get your pay but never get paid for preaching and teaching. And that's the opposite of what we do. We give the, we tell the pastors, you don't have to do anything. You, you don't have to have a work or a labor job. You just do this and we'll give you enough money to live. We don't want you to have to work <laughs> like a regular person, like the rest of us. We're going to give you a privileged status over us. So we do it exactly the opposite of what Jesus says, but I digress. Anyway, let's go here. Paul's writing is no better than the jargon of a conjurer who picks up phrases he does not understand to confound the credulous people who come to have their fortunes told, Age of Reason, 1827 edition, 165, which we will look at below. Anyway, I just want to show you what I found interestingly uh, something he said in his preface, and this is in the 1794 edition. I, I, uh, it's funny, when you open up the other ones, you never see the way he would have presented the book to you. Only the original book, 1794, do you see how he intended you to see right away this preface. So he says, uh, to my fellow citizens of the United States of America, I put the following work under your protection. It contains my opinion upon religion. You will do me the justice to remember that I have always strenuously supported the right of every man to his own opinion, however different that opinion might be to mine. He who denies to another this right makes a slave of himself to his present opinion because he precludes himself the right of changing it. So I just thought in this era of censorship, basically, uh, you know, Facebook will censor you, censorship, censor you, YouTube will censor you, articles are just buried, even if a Seymour Hirsch were to say something that doesn't fit with the narrative, it's uh, allegedly uh, false. <laughs> so this is the world we live in today. We live in a dictatorship of opinion where only one opinion is valid and every other opinion is censored. 
and that is a crime against the rights of man, which is another book <laughs> that Thomas Paine wrote. So I thought when I saw this, I said, you know what, this is the one, this is the article I should do next because it's such a, the preface itself is so contemporary with the problems we have today, but I digress. Anyway, and he said a, a couple of things I wanted to show you that are not related to Paul, but are interesting and, and we'll see why. 1894 edition of his work at page six. I believe in one God and no more, and I hope for happiness beyond this life. I believe the equality of man, and I believe that religious duties consist in doing justice, loving mercy, and endeavoring to make our fellow creatures happy. So people shouldn't say just because Thomas Paine attacks uh, the law, like Paul does, and he attacks the Christian uh, Jesus, <laughs> as Paul undermines by attacking the law, which the Christian Jesus, the Christian, of the, the Christ of the Bible, the Christ of the New Te the, uh, the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that, that Jesus doesn't fit into Paul's theology. If you are use some common reading principles known as English meanings, assuming those are correctly translated. So that's another layer. But the point is, this man is not a unholy man. This is not a man advocating evil. This is not a man saying, you, you, you know, you can live without any law in your life. He's just simply saying he, he does justice, basically based on reason, loves mercy, being forgiving. He endeavors to make his fellow creatures happy. So he's not trying to be, he's trying to promote goodness. So I, I'm, I think we need to respect people who don't agree with us and we need to see where they're coming from because probably it only would have taken a nudge, a little bit of a nudge by someone who knew the the validity, how to prove Holy Scripture. He could have been convinced of inspiration, but that's not how we are ever presented it. It's not that we can prove, we modern Christianity does not try to prove the validity of Scripture based on its the way it was supposed to be done, which is something is prophetic or God speaks from heaven in front of witnesses like at Exodus, uh, you know, in uh, the book of Exodus, uh, when the law is given to Moses, where God, everybody can hear God's word, same thing, the transfiguration of Jesus, everybody heard God's word, there were many witnesses, the 12 apostles were all present, by the way, at the baptism of John, when John gave the baptism to Jesus, and the word of God spoke from heaven over Jesus' multiple multiple sentences. So this is why Jesus have a, has a special status uh, and in in why he can be confirmed and that did have multiple witnesses so that gives you credence and jesus doesn't even say anything re remotely anything like paul which would negate god's law i mean he's if anything he's ratcheting it up a little higher a little more in the heart than just in the, in the action so there's nothing jesus does says or does that ever uh, is anywhere close to what paul does so we could I think have reasoned with Mr. Payne that you should allow some revelation in from somebody who is edifying and is along your same belief system. He believed Jesus believed in one God, right? He said the he addressed the Father, Father in John 17, 1 to 3. Jesus says, Father, you are the you, Father, are the only true God. Right? He said that. He believes in one God. And he said in Mark, the most important commandment in 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 the entire Bible is the Lord our God is one God. Okay. So, and he's quoting Deuteronomy, I think it's uh, 6, verse 4. And so Thomas Paine could have got along with Jesus if somebody had presented Jesus better to him. But he doesn't accept the New Testament because Paul destroyed it, because Paul destroyed the old the law. You see, it just all gets mesh, meshed up. All right. What he does say, I think it's also interesting on the same page, is all national institution of churches, whether Jewish, Christian, or Turkish, appear to me no other than human inventions set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. Well, that's what happens when you violate Jesus' command to take no money to preach and teach because there would be no incentive to do exactly what's happening here. However, in time, when Constantine intervened, we that was the first time any of the clergy was put on salary. Check it out. <laughs> there was nobody taking money to preach and teach. And that was um, uh, in a book, Pagan Christianity, uh, that... that records that also that there was no history of, of early people who whoever was teaching or preaching would never take money and that was considered sinful to even ask for money and if anybody did ask for money uh don't you know basically just give them a small gift to go on their way but don't don't support them that's not what the gospel's for 
But that's not what Paul taught. Paul taught we should make our living by our gospel. And that's completely at odds with Jesus, as I mentioned in Matthew 10. Anyway, so again, these are interesting things. And this shows you when you when you have the Bible distorted by someone like Paul, what's left over is somebody like him who's trying to get us away from what Paul's Paul's path put us on, which is the way of to make money is to actually become a clergy person in the line of Paul, not in the line of Jesus, because you can't justify taking money because Jesus said you can't. He told the apostles, freely you were given, freely you must give. You know, do, do not take any money. And so he clearly was saying the only way to make support is to become a guest in someone's home and then become a worker worthy of your wage, as I said earlier. All right. Now let's take a look at another thing, and I'm going to take a quick break. All right, and this is at page 25 of the 1894 edition of uh, In the Age of Reason. He says, And all the other parts of the New Testament, except the book of enigmas called Revelation, our collection of letters under the name of epistles, and the forgery of letters has been such a common practice in the world that the probability is at least equal whether they are genuine or forged. Which, by the way, I, I mean, it's po that's truly possible. That's another problem we have, which... Uh, that's why you always want to go back earlier than the period when the church fell into corruption, when it started to put, uh, the, Constantine put our, uh, the teachers and preachers and so on under uh, Roman control. They now were called priests. They now also call themselves fathers. How could they do that when Jesus said no man can call themselves fathers? Well, that's because in the Mithras religion, that's exactly what you called the leader of the community, pater. So they just bought, they, basically the Mithraic, Mithraic religion, which is a sun or solar based religion, had this uh, same similar structure to what Roman Catholicism exactly fell into and, ex and exactly conformed to. So th that's that era and any writing after that point could be corrupted by uh, political influence. But it, we need to always dig for the writings that go back earlier in time before Constantine to find the true original, more authentic works. And we have found them. Agnes uh, Lewis found a uh, the Syriac uh, palimpsest, and that's an important recovery of the four early Gospels. And there's even evidence prior to that quoted in the early church fathers, which is another way to get back to the original. But I digress. But I want you to read the next part. One thing, however, is much less equivocal, which is that of the matters contained in those books, together with the assistance of some old stories, the church has set up a system of religion very contradictory to the character of the person whose name it bears, and has set up a religion of pomp and of revenue in pretended imitation of a person whose life was humility and poverty, which is very similar to one of the quotes we had earlier at the beginning. So again, he's he's showing you the how how did a religion ever emerge from someone who was teaching and preaching uh, basically, you know, sharing your 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 uh, income with poor people, making sure you're very charitable, and so on. It just seems that we have not. We're all about how do we make money, becoming a, a preacher or a teacher or whatever it is, and that's really antith antithetical to what is the real goal of Christianity, which is to be a servant of God to help other people in whatever circumstance they are. And that's not just simply telling them the truth of God's word, but actually taking some tangible steps to help people. And, you know, go go help somebody. Go do something today to to that nobody's going to pay you for that is going to help somebody. But I digress. Okay. Anyway, just some interesting things I th thought. Um, and then this is another interesting thing, it says at page 27, again, of this uh, work from 1894, version of Age of Reason. He says... But some perhaps will say, are we to have no word of God, no revelation? He's realizing, you know, well, people want to know what's revelation now if you don't have the, the law and the prophets and you don't have the New Testament, okay? He says, I answer, yes, there is a word of God. There is a revelation. And what is that? The word of God is the creation we behold. And it is in this word, which no human invention can counterfeit or alter, that God speaks universally to man. And that's generally true, although we have seen in the modern era that the whole idea of uh, the creation has become, you know, you can actually affirm as a scientist that the world, the universe in the Big Bang came from nothing, which uh, is technically um, what it appears to be. But obviously, you can't have everything come from zero, <laughs> from nothing. So there has to be an explanation. It's begging for an explanation and, th and that a scientist would not tell you what is the most likely explanation. 
And, and the thing we now know is the parameters of that explosion were not random. It wasn't like when you blow up a, uh, you took a, let's say, a, a little firecracker or something, or you took a, a little mini uh, larger firecracker and you blew something up and it just sp goes in a hundred different directions, uncontrolled. No, it turned out that this explosion had uh, what they call the anthropic principle uh, parameters. And those parameters are so fine tuned. The fine tuning is, you know, one in a billion trillion chances that this could come out exactly the way you get it because it's a very organized universe. It's, it is not random. And that's the interesting thing. Spiral galaxies are not random. Other galaxies are not random. And nebula, you see, that's not random. And the reason they're beautiful is they're not truly random. They are definitely in patterns and definitely uh, patterns that do not conform to chance. And that's what... Uh, what uh, the, the Dr. Hugh Ross, a Christian, has done, a, an astronomer, has done an excellent job with a series of books proving that. And so if you don't know about the anthropic principle and how to articulate that, you should go to his books. And if you found someone who doesn't even accept revelation, such as the, the uh, Law and Prophets or the New Testament in any portion, but the Jesus portion is what we're advocating for sure, is... Uh, and, and the book of Acts for history, just so you know, and the usefulness of letters other than Paul's. Those are inimical. They're the work of an apostate, so they can't be considered scripture. And that's what the early church said. So anyway, if you want to lead someone to Christ, you got to first get them to believe in God. So you should uh, probably invest in time, your own time to get some of you Ross's books. And we'll maybe talk about those in the future. Um, but that's a very important part of uh, your evangelism for Christ in the future. And then here's another quote about Paul. And I just thought uh, this was nobody's really highlighted this one that much, except this part here. All this is nothing better than the jargon of a conjurer. So what is what is the context is useful? Let's go read this. And then that's going to wrap it up. I think that's all I've got. Uh, I think so. Anyway, page 165 of the 1827 edition. As to the doubtful jargon ascribed to Paul in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, which makes part of the burial service of some Christians' sect sectaries, it is as destitute of meaning as the tolling of the bell at the funeral. It explains nothing to the understanding. It illustrates nothing to the imagination, but leaves a reader to find any meaning if he can. And this is the quote he's quoting. All flesh, says he, is not the same flesh. There is one flesh of men, another of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. End of quote. And then Tom Spain asks, and what then? Nothing? A good cook, a, a cook could have said as much. In other words, he's saying, is this profound? It's just like, yeah, there's flesh, different flesh for animals, birds, and humans. Okay, let's continue. A cook could have said as much. Quote, there are also, says he, bodies celestial and bodies terrestrial. The glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. End of quote. Thomas Paine says, and what then? Nothing. What is the difference? What is the difference? Nothing that he has told. In other words, he, he's Paul's just using words that don't go anywhere. They just, of course, there's different, <laughs> there's different celestial bodies, and, and 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 so what? What's that about? So he's Paul is just rattling on, is what he's saying. He's why is he doing that? He's trying to sound profound, is what I think he's trying to imply here. Here's the next quote from Paul. There is, says he, one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, end of quote. And then Thomas Paine says, and what then? Nothing. <laughs> Except that he says that one star differs from another star in glory instead of distance, and he might have well have told us the moon did not shine so bright as the sun. All this is nothing better than the jargon of a conjurer who picks up phrases he does not understand to confound the credulous people who come to have their fortunes told. Priests and conjurers, conjurers of the same are of the same trade. So I think this is uh, just a, a point that we don't often reflect upon, but Paul says a lot of, that's uh, not, not simply just nonsense, but he just rattles on for only to seem you know more intelligent or more profound and uh, without any substantive point to it. And what's the point of telling us that there's flesh, that's different flesh for animals, birds, and whatever? Well, oh, so what? There's different amount of glory for different stars. What does that have to do with anything? It, it doesn't prove anything. It's just the way it is. And unless you're going to tell us what it means and what he points out, Thomas Paine is pointing out, is he doesn't explain himself. So w why would someone do that to you as an audience? It, it's meaning, it, like, there, there's ways that people argue things where they just make up stuff as they go along. So it just doesn't, 
it just sh should be put you on guard that you're not listening to someone who's even listening to his own words. <laughs> he just goes uh, on trying to sound profound where there's nothing profound, nothing deep. All right. Uh, let me see. There might have been one more thing I wanted to show you. Oh, oh yes, very much so. Okay, let me just break here and I'll come right back. Okay, now this is a footnote. I, I'm led to understand this is the actual footnote of um, Thomas Paine. It reads like him and so on. So I'm trusting that isn't uh, somebody edited them, themselves later. So this is page 159 of the 1894 edition. And Paine finds the Ebonite writings summarized by Boulanger in the French work Life of Paul. Now, I'm going to show you where this comes from. But I want to show you this man has studied Paul. He's read a book about Paul. So he's not just talking off the cuff. He is informed, and there's a lot more here, but Boulanger, Boulanger was a Frenchman. He wrote in Fran French, and Paine could read in French. So he then reads this book, and he's going to make an extract of that book and uh, from the second chapter of, the, of that work. So if we could get that book in French, we would find these. this is there, and then you would find this quote here about the Ebionites. So we have we at this channel have showed you the Ebionites are actually the name of the original church. It's even referenced in Galatians. Uh, Paul was told by the, the Peter to Peter, James, and John to remember the poor at Jerusalem. And uh, as Jerome steps in later in his commentary, he points out that's really a reference to the name of the early church, the Ebion. So the Ebionites or the Nazarenes, who were the first Christians, this is Boulanger rejected all the epistles of Paul and regarded him as an imposter. They report, among other things, that he was originally a pagan, that he came to Jerusalem where he lived some time, and that having a mind to marry the daughter of the high priest, he had himself been circumcised, but that not to not being able to obtain her, he quarreled with the Jews and wrote against circumcision and against the observation of the Sabbath and against all of the legal ordinances. Now, where does this come from? So he doesn't give you the site that maybe more that maybe uh, Belanger had given. <clears throat> so we're going to show you we wrote about this in our book, Jesus Words Only, Chapter Twelve. So this is not hard to find. I don't remember how I found it, but I definitely did not find it through Thomas Paine. But uh, this is this is what it is. It's from Epiphanius. He was a uh, what would be called an Orthodox Christian, meaning a, a traditional. Uh, Roman Catholic uh, figure of that era, but in this era that was pretty new, you know, the Constantine era had only begun in 325. So this is, these are pe people who still could remember the way Christianity used to be maybe <laughs> before Constantine. I don't know. Anyway, and he wrote a book called Panarion, and it's, this is in uh, chapter 30, part 16, and it's items six through nine. And he, according to uh, at that passage, what he says is they, meaning the Ebion, declare that he, Paul, was a Greek. See, and that's up here, if you read here, that he was a pagan. See that? And Paul is a Greek, by the way. I mean, he can speak Greek. He comes from a city of Tarsus. That's where he was born. That is a Greek city in a Greek-speaking area of, of Asia Minor. I, Asia Minor is currently now Turkey, where they don't speak Greek anymore. But Greek is <clears throat> the country of Greece was just across the, the Aegean Sea, from uh, Asia Minor. <clears throat> he went up to Jerusalem, they say, and when he had spent some time there, he was seized with a passion to marry the daughter of the priest. For this reason, he became a proselyte and was circumcised. And then when he failed to get the girl, he flew into a rage and wrote against circumcision and against the Sabbath and the law. So that's a fairly decent uh, paraphrase by Boulanger in his book, The Life of Paul. Okay, now, and then I make a comment in the book, Jesus Words Only. This is from that. The Ebonites does say that Paul was not 100% Jew, but the son of two Gentile parents. Note, if a grandparent on his father's side were from the tribe of Benjamin, then Paul could be a Benjamite because you, the lineage, what lineage you belong to, is measured by the house of the father. Even though there's tradition that if your mother isn't Jewish, then you're not Jewish. But the actual biblical standard is that you have to have a father in the line, and that is how you measure what tribe you belong to and what your, your genealogy is. He became circumcised as an adult. So you might then realize why Paul's so much against circumcision, because he's experienced what it's like to do without anesthesia in the modern era. So it's like, nobody's going to want to become a, 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 if Christians, if Jew, if Gentiles had to become circumcised in order to become a, a Christian, then what? how many Christians would ever do that? But you see, it turned out that when the church 
at, at uh, Jerusalem was asked the question Acts 15, it was so insignificant, they didn't even address it. If you look at the Acts 15 conference, that was the question posed, and yet they never mentioned that in particular, yay or nay. Because, and why would that be? Because there are exceptions where a Gentile, if they want to go inside the temple and inside the holy place of the temple, I should say, they must be circumcised. And that's where the Jews are allowed to go and any Gentile who's circumcised. See? So um, th th there was still a point for circumcision. So in Acts 15, they decided, you know what, we're not even going to, we're going to, we're not going to require it and we'll let them. It says, basically, it says that James. It records that we're just going to put these things on the Gentiles now. There's two or three uh, rules about what to eat, what they can and cannot eat, and there was rules about uh, fornication and other moral issues. And and then he says at the end, he says for each week the law of Moses is read uh, as has oh, has been for centuries, basically, meaning this is how they're going to learn more stuff. We don't have to go through it all now. It will give them it all all at once. So. Clearly, it was the issue of circumcision was not even addressed by the Acts 15 conference. So, but Paul was very in, in, antithetical to that as a step of, of conversion, and and he's right. That's not in, there is no biblical standard for a, you, a Gentile never is to become a Jew or a son of Israel. Like you can't do that. It's just that's, that's not how it works. You're not converted by circumcision. But that's what the Pharisees thought. So Paul had to make a big deal that you, you know, Gentiles shouldn't be circumcised to become a son of Israel. Well, of course, because it's not in the Bible. <laughs> that's not, you are Jew, there's sons of Israel and there's sojourners, ger, G-E-R. God never says how to convert a ger to a son of Israel because it's not possible. Son of Israel is an ethnic group. You can't become a, an ethnic group by being circumcised. So that was not true. God had a special plan for this, the Gentiles, and that's in Isaiah 56. If you obey my Sabbath and you keep my covenant, which is the Ten Commandments, you will be welcome in my holy place on my holy mountain. See, it's very easy. Paul didn't even know the message of salvation in Isaiah 56 for Gentiles. I don't know why. Jesus quotes it. Did you know Jesus quotes that passage? Yeah, he quotes it when he's talking about my house will be a house of prayer, and he throws out the money changers. He quotes it verbatim. So how did Paul miss this? Because he doesn't read anything. He doesn't read anything of the Gospels. He doesn't want to know anything of the Gospels, but I digress. Anyway, but I just want to show you one thing. <clears throat> the significance of trusting the Ebionite charge, however, is this means they were proving Paul to be untruthful. Why do I say that? Because Paul claimed he was born a Jew and circumcised on the eighth day. That's, uh, I think that's Philemon 3.5 or it's Philippians. <laughs> Philemon is P-H-M-N usually or could be, but nobody's consistent about it. So it, it's probably, well, you know what? Let's go take a look what this is. <laughs> it's Philippians. Okay, then we got that. All right. <clears throat> so now that fits in also with uh, Revelation 2 verse 2, where the false claim to apostleship was proven a liar at Ephesus. It also fits the parallel statement by Jesus in Revelations about those who lie and say they're Jews but are not. So technically, even though Paul could be a Benjamite because of his grandparent, could be a father in his father line, could be from Benjamin, he, he is no, no longer considered a Jewish person, son of Israel. So you could, be a, you could be a Benjamite, but you're no longer a true son of Israel because you no longer have a parent who is, um, in, in, you know, an immediate parent that is of a son of Israel stock so to speak. So the parent of Paul's might have been, was would have been considered Gentile, uncircumcised, and his parent might have been, the grandparent might have been Benjamite. And that would give Paul the qualification of being a Benjamite. And you have to also know that to be a member of a tribe or to be, uh, yes, to be a member of a tribe is different. You can be a Gentile and be a member of a tribe. And most people don't know that. They think, oh, no, you have to be a son of Israel. Well, technically, no, because if you study the way that when Joseph is added to the, uh, there are two half-tribes added from uh, the Egyptian mother uh, who Joseph had married and he had children. Those, I think it's Manasseh and one other, I forget the name, but definitely Manasseh. So those are not, those are not sons of Israel, but they're tribes. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So how did these half-tribes come into equal one full tribe they're Gentiles, and they are 
uh, not sons of Israel, except through their grandfather <laughs> or their father. You could say if Joseph had children, they would be Manasseh and so on. So they're technically, uh, the mother is definitely not Jewish. So in that sense, they may not qualify by to be Jewish in the traditional sense. Um, I don't think there's actually a biblical statement that they're not sons of Israel because the mother is a uh, Gentile, but she clearly was. She was a, uh, um, I think she, she was an Egyptian priestess's daughter, Pre uh, excuse me, an Egyptian priest's daughter. So Joseph is marrying somebody clearly outside the sons of Israel area. So you can have people who are Gentiles who are in tribes. Also in uh, it's Ezekiel, Ezekiel 42, he says, wherever Gentile decides they want to go, they can pick any tribe's land to go into. And then when you go into that tribal land, the tribal land was allotted. If you didn't know how that worked, it's in the Bible. So you get a certain amount of land. And so there's a, a lot of land left over that's never been allotted. And so in, in this would be the, uh, the, the Gentile would be given a lot of land, uh, you know, like homesteading in the old days of uh, the Wild West. You just keep homesteading until you fill up on the land. <laughs> somebody owns, somebody will own everything. So there was no such thing as selling off, you know, the, the, the forest to one, one guy because he has a lot of money. It was all to be divided over time, which I just want to tell you, when I lived in Costa Rica, that's exactly how the people did everything. They had divided up little pieces of land. They would build a little house on their little plot of land. But they would keep patrimony, meaning all the other land would be like, un, you know, land that we could farm with or just use as pasture land. But that was designed for the ancestors of that that patrial line within that family in the peaceful people of Costa Rica. So it was really, really beautiful to watch. And we were living on one of these uh, pro, uh, houses they had built inside of the patrimony. And then you could just see the uh, the corn, not the corn. Um, was it corn? I think maybe maybe it was corn. It was growing on the, on the uh, oh no, uh, it was sugarcane. Sugarcane is growing in our backyard, but all this land belongs to the family, the patrimony. But nobody would take, nobody, uh, every single member who came from the, the grandfather and then the sons and the daughters and they get married, they all would take just a little plot extra. And so they would just slowly accrete into the land till they would eventually obviously fill it up or move away or whatever. So this is really a, a, a common sense way of, uh, of people who feel themselves in a community to share land. They don't just take it all for themselves and I'm going to get to, you know, I'm the rich person, I'm going to buy it all up. No, everybody had a small house on a large piece of property <laughs> in Israel, so to speak. And you could all share the common land, see how it would work. So it was very, uh, uh, there was private property, but there was also community property. So it was a very uh, a mixed type of property arrangement. Anyway, I digress. My po point here is that Paul uh, could be a Benjamite, could be a Benjamite even if he was pure Gentile because he had uh, been part of the lineage of somebody who uh, was a Benjamite before him, or he had moved in when he came to Israel. He just moves into the land of the Benjamites. According to Ezekiel, he's allowed to do that and become a Benjamite. Basically, what else could he be? He's living in the Benjamite territory. So, but he doesn't become a sin of Israel by doing that. He's still a sojourner. He doesn't have to be circumcised because that's, and I'm sorry, some people say, no, 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 that's wrong. That's wrong. No, it, 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 there is a command. Only sons of Israel need to be circumcised unless a sojourner wants to go into the temple or wants to celebrate Passover with a person who is a son of Israel. This is in the Bible. So anyway, I hope this helps everybody. Uh, this is uh, Thomas Paine. He's he has a lot of other interesting points that maybe in another episode we'll talk about. They're not they're on the Bible in general. All right, God bless. Take care, everybody. Ciao, bye.